All right, good afternoon. Um, the Secretary General spoke at the meeting of the Committee of the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People earlier today. He told committee members that although he would like to see a Palestinian state and an Israeli state, both with the capital in Jerusalem, we must face today's difficult reality. He said that decades of convergence and global consensus could be eroding, making effective concerted action more difficult to achieve at a time when it is more important than ever. The Secretary General warned that the ongoing settlement construction and expansion is a major obstacle to peace and must be halted and reversed. He added that violence and incitement continue to feel, fuel a climate of fear and mistrust. He added that he was extremely concerned that the la latest shortfall in UNRWA funding will be gravely impair the agency's ability to deliver on its mandate and preserve critical services such as education, health care for Palestine refugees. He reiterated that there is no plan B. A two-state solution is the only way to achieve the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people and secure a sustainable solution to the conflict. His remarks are available online. <clears throat> and as a reminder that the Secretary General will travel to the Republic of Korea. He will leave tomorrow uh, in uh, the Republic of Korea. He's expected to meet with President Moon Jae-in, as well as Foreign Minister Kang Yo excuse me, Kang Yo Kang. He will also attend the opening ceremony of the Olympic Winter Games in Pyeongchang, and he will be back in New York on Saturday. Izumi Nakamitsu, the Under Secretary General for Disarmament Affairs, told the Security Council in a briefing this morning that the OPCW fact-finding mission continues to call to look into all allegations of the use of chemical weapons in Syria, the majority of which involve the use of toxic chemicals such as such as chlorine in areas not under the control of the government. The fact-finding mission expects to submit a report on these allegations very soon. In addition, she said another fact-finding mission team has been looking into allegations of the use of chemical weapons brought to the attention of the OPCW by the government of Syria. At a time of the Council's last briefing, a team was in Damascus at the invitation of the government to look into several of these allegations. She said that she, um, she said should the teams conclude that there has been use or likely use of chemical weapons of any of these alleged incidents, our obligation is to enact a meaningful response will be further intensified. Mrs. Na Ms. Nakamitsu expressed the hope that such a response will favor unity and not impunity. We've also, um, I had received a bit earlier today a question concerning a gift that the Special Envoy for Syria, Staffan de Mistura, received in Vienna a few weeks back from Ambassador Bashar Jafari. I can confirm that as per applicable UN rules and regulations, the replica of the old peace treaty offered by Ambassador Jafari to Mr. de Mistura on January 25th in Vienna was registered as soon as the team came back from Vienna, and it was registered in the UN office uh, gift registry under the number 442. It was handed over to relevant colleagues in the property management of the UN office in Geneva, and the ethics office was also duly informed. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that escalating conflict in Taiz and Hudaydah in, in Yemen since December 2017 has displayed, displaced nearly 47,000 people uh, to Aden and other governorates in the south. The situation in Aden is reported as calm, with schools, ports, and airports operating as normal. Humanitarian activities are also resuming. <clears throat> Although food, fuel, and medical imports are flowing again through all the ports, the blockade in the weeks leading up to uh, December 20th has had a severe impact on Yemeni families and businesses. Food prices during the blockade rose 47% above average compared to the Conf before the conflict escalated in March of 2015. And civilians uh, c returns to Iraq's newly accessible areas continue to increase since the conclusion of major Daesh operations late last year. Across the country, 3.2 million previously displaced people have returned to their home areas. In January, this number surpassed the number of people displaced in Iraq which is currently 2.6 million people for the first time since the start of the crisis in December of 2013. Returns have primarily been to Anbar, Ninewa, Saladin governorates, which account for 82% of the total returns and 86% of the remaining internally displaced people. <clears throat> and from the Congo, the humanitarian coordinator for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Kim Bolduc, 
uh, concluded her first mission to the Kasai region in Tanganyika province. She witnessed firsthand the humanitarian needs in those two areas that are among the most affected by internally displaced in the country. She stressed the need to, for authorities to ensure that organizations are able to work in accordance with humanitarian principles. She also called for greater collaboration between Congolese authorities and humanitarians. The 2018 Humanitarian Response Plan for the country, which was launched in January, is seeking $1.68 billion to help with 10.5 million people. And that is double the amount requested in 2017. And in the Gambia, the Secretary General's Youth Envoy, Jayatma Wikramanayake, spoke at the International Forum on Female Genital Mutilation. She said this harmful practice deprives women of their human rights and derails millions of girls from achieving their full potential. She also called on all stakeholders for the effective implementation of the, FG, the end of FGM laws and praised the youth-led movement in the Gambia to end this practice. Wherever I go, I have learned one can always count on young people to stand up for what is right, to fight against injustice, and to push all to create a world that is better and more equal for all. And uh, we have a sad note from our colleagues at the UN Environmental Program who are mourning the death of Esmond Bradley Martin, a renowned ivory trade researcher who was killed in Kenya on Sunday, according to multiple media reports. Mr. Bradley was once for a former UN Special Envoy on rhino conservation. He worked for decades researching the markets for wildlife products across Africa and Asia. His research informed many of the decisions of the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species in Wild Fauna and Flora, a global agreement that regulates trade in wildlife products. <clears throat> and um, you saw that over the weekend we issued a joint statement from the Secretary General and the African Union Commission uh, head, Musa Faki Mahamat, on uh, Guinea-Bissau. They expressed concern at the protracted political crisis in Guinea-Bissau, and that statement is online. And today we found a uh, survey report from the International Labor Organization, which uh, caught our eye. Uh, the, in the survey released today, a joint survey by the International Labor Organization and the University of Nebraska-Lincoln reveals marked differences in the opinions of European male and female economists when it comes to policy. The survey was administered in 18 European countries and showed that female economists are less likely than their male counterparts to favor market solutions over government interventions and more likely to favor environmental protection policies. For example, women economists are more likely than men to disagree with the notion that stronger employment protection results in weaker economic growth and more likely to agree that European Union should continue its ban on planting genetically modified crops. The ILO said the results demonstrate the need to include both women and men in economic policy debates and development. More information on the ILO's website. And today, our thanks go to Ireland, which was, has paid its regular budget dues in full for 2018. And as they say in Gaelic, Gora Mila Ma Og Weave, which says thank you, I hope. That's what I was told. Um, which brings us up to 38. Matthew, go ahead. I knew you had the number. I held back. You didn't ask, so I didn't. I, I wanted to, to, to uh, I'm going to ask you about that gift registry, but I wanted to ask you first to, I guess, try to close out the meeting that the Secretary General had with ICC indicted Omar al-Bashir. You said uh, that he complied with all the rules. Since you last said that and since he didn't answer on, on Friday, I've come to understand that the notice given to the ICC was after the fact and that, in fact, a notice was given to them prior, last year, for Amina J. Muhammad when she might have met, met Bashir, saying that it might happen, so they told it as they should have, as they, under the guidelines in advance. So I'm wondering, how can you explain this? Since it's said that he met with Bashir about South Sudan because he wanted to meet with all countries, it seems pretty clear that, at least as presented, he planned it in advance. So why didn't he tell the ICC in advance? I think the, the ICC was notified of the meeting, and I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, do you, have you read the guidelines? I mean, I, 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 I read I've, them out I've, to you. I've, it I've, says I've, in I've, advance. I've, I've underst I right. understand what you've read, and, and I'm answering your questions to the best of my So ability. I guess my question is, the, it also, the guidelines also say that there should be a letter to the, I, to the ICC prosecutor and to the head of the mm -hmm. State Assembly of, Assembly of State Parties stating not only that the meeting is taking place, but the reasons and the necessity for the meeting. Can you release that letter? No. Why not? Uh, because it's a letter from the legal counsel to the Secretary General and will not be released. Yes, sir. 
Thank you. In your announcement of the trip to uh, South Korea mm -hmm. by the uh, Secretary General and the meetings he will have there, uh, there doesn't seem to be any meeting with the North Korean with a North Korean um, official who will be heading the uh, the delegation of the North. And it seems that this is. Uh, the speaker of the of the parliament no. why is there no, no meeting uh, with the, this the person? meetings i the, the the trip has two parts one is an official i mean it, it is an official visit to the republic of korea so there are official meetings with the president and the foreign minister as as we do in most cases so those meetings are set while the secretary general is in pyeongchang at the opening of the games he will likely have a number of bilaterals there are a number of uh, uh, senior heads of states or heads of delegations um that schedule has yet to be worked out. Uh, I think we'll come to know those bilaterals probably as as they happen or as they get uh, as they get fixed. Is there a uh, an official request by the Secretary General or by the North Koreans for a bilateral? I'm not aware meeting? of such an official request. Thank you, Stefan. <coughs> uh, you just mentioned about the UNRWA's difficulty in mm -hmm. funding. Uh, after the U.S. degree, the, the uh, withdrew some of the funding. Uh, do you have any data and the knowledge about uh, how many countries and the, what amount of money of lacking in funding UNRWA after the U.S. The withdrew some of the funding? What we've been told by UNRWA, and we checked again uh, just before the briefing, that a number of countries uh, have fast-tracked monies that were meant to be delivered this year. You know, sometimes for various budgetary reasons, country give uh, their, um, uh, their uh, allotment to UN agencies and tranches at different parts of the year. So a number of countries have said, we're gonna fast-track so you get the money quicker than you would have, right? But that's not new money. Uh, so it's really kind of a temporary fill of a whole, there still needs to be new money. Right now, only uh, as far as I know, only the the state of Kuwait has pledged uh, new money. Uh, I know our colleagues at UNRWA are hard at work trying to organize a uh, ministerial meeting uh, to bring uh, potential donors uh, together. But you know, the UN agencies don't operate with with reserves, so uh, I think they're trying to meet their immediate. Uh, immediate needs, uh, but when you, you take money that was supposed to be spent later and you spend it now, you're not solving the problem. You're just really putting on a very temporary Band-Aid. Mr. Lee. Sure. Alternate things around. I wanted to ask you, in, in, in Kenya, um, there was a court order saying to reopen uh, the TV stations that were closed down during Raila Odinga's uh, self-inauguration. And not all, two have opened, but Citizen TV is not open. People have been tear gassed as they protest for opening it. And I'm wondering what, what does the UN think about this, the, the government not, not only closing a TV station, but not obeying a court order to reopen it? Look, I think it's, it's important that uh, th there be a climate in which uh, journalists can operate uh, freely. I think as we, um, as, as we said earlier, it's important that all Kenyan political actors work together to uphold the Constitution and work together to strengthen governance and uphold human rights and the rule of law. Okay, speaking of courts, um, Patrick Ho, who is the head mm -hmm. of the China Energy Fund Committee, yeah. is arguing for bail again today in the U.S. In opposing it, put in writing that they've executed a search warrant at China Energy Fund Committee, the NGO's mm -hmm. offices in Virginia. It seems the China Energy Fund Committee is still in special consultative status with ICOSOC, even as its offices are being mm -hmm. raided mm -hmm. and, and its uh, head is, is in jail. What are the procedures for... for as far as I'm aware, you know, the, the consultative status of ECOSOC, as opposed to the DPI status, mm -hmm. is one that is uh, managed by the member states. There is a committee of ECOSOC uh, that is made up of member states. They give, uh, they grant or deny consultative status to various NGOs. Uh, I think we'll have to look, uh, you can contact ECOSOC to see what the exact rules are, uh, but my assumption would be that if member states grant, only member states can take away. Right, but is there any, I guess, given, I've seen there's a, I go to the NGO committee, there's yeah, yeah. people trying to get in. Right. What's the provision for, like, if there's a court order, what if, what if, a, if an organization Well, I think, you have, I think you, have to, you have to contact the chair of, okay. the, of the NGO committee. And can I ask you on Maldives? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Sure. You put out a statement on Maldives, but again, it's, it's one of these situations where it seems like President Abdullah Yamin has not complied with releasing the opponents. In fact, he's issued a, 
uh, state of emergency. I'm wondering, is there is DPI is DPA actually involved, or is it just is it issuing statements from New York, or is it trying to speak with him and engage? We're, we're we're very concerned with the the ongoing developments in uh, in the Maldives, including what we've seen in the last uh, in the last 24 hours. We're following it uh, we're following it very closely, um, and I you know the. The Secretary General would again call on the government to respect uh, the court ruling and to, for restraint to be to be exercised. And we, I do expect a more formal statement on this uh, shortly. Mr. Uchardo. Yeah, hi, Stefan. I just want to draw your attention to a uh, press item that occurred uh, over the weekend about the U.S. Uh, uh, Mr. Trump's nominee for the International Organization for Migration, Ken Isaacs who was found to have made statements on social media calling uh, Muslims inherently violent. And I would like to know if uh, we can get a reaction from you or the Secretary General about that. Uh, the, the, the selection of the uh, Director General of the International Organization for Migration is a decision that does not involve the member, does not involve the Secretary General. It, it's only done by the, uh, the Assembly uh, the governing body of the International Organization for for Migration. Right, but do you have some reaction to, to, to this? Look, I, I don't know the veracity of those statements. I mean, I think that this came out in within the uh, the context of a, a potential nominee put forward by one member state. As I said, this is this is not a process that involves the Secretary General. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Thanks. Uh, you, since the item that you read at the top about uh, the gift from Jafari to, to mm -hmm. from Ambassador Jafari to Mr. to Mr. Stewart. I wasn't aware, I guess, that there is, is this gift registry public? And I wanted to know, because I've asked in the past about this golden statue that the Secretary General mm -hmm. himself received from Paul B. of Cameroon, and it was all kind of murky. Is, it, is there a similar number I that can be I think there's a gift re registry here uh, at the UN. Let me, let me look into it. And was that put into the, I, also on Cameroon, I won't get into the ethics office part of it, but as you, one, I wanted to make sure that there's no statement <sighs> on the 47 people refooled back, and also if there's any statement on, over the weekend, there have been increased clashes, killing of civilians uh, reported. Uh, on, on the refoulement, uh, we've made, uh, you know, we, we've pointed you to the UNHCR uh, statement with which, as a matter of principle, the Secretary General.